Welcome to this video of our worship service at Clover Creek Church of the Brethren for May 24th, 2020. This is Memorial Day weekend. Monday's the holiday. We acknowledge on Memorial Day and, and remember those loved ones who have passed before us, having lost their lives in service to an ideology of governance that is free and just. Historically, as we have gathered together on the Sunday preceding Memorial Day, we have remembered by calling out names of both servicemen and also those mentors and saints who have had an everlasting impact on our lives. Since our worship this year is virtual, Pastor Barb will have a time in our worship service a little bit later to silently remember those saints in our lives who have passed. On the Christian calendar, we celebrate this past Thursday as Ascension Day remembering the ascension of Jesus Christ to heaven, marking the end of Christ's first coming. Today we acknowledge and remember that God allowed himself to pass before us in the person of Christ, to make possible for those who believe life. In our celebration, we do not focus on the past or what was lost, but we look forward to the second coming of Christ. In that belief resides the hope and promise of a future reunion with our loved ones. Looking forward, we are looking ahead to the time when we will be when we will open the church doors for public worship once again. Church leadership is in conversation about what that will look like and have mailed surveys to all members requesting your input so that we might meet the most of your needs and that we might gather your input. Your opinion counts, so please return those sur surveys as soon as you can. Let us now come together in spirit for worship of an almighty God who has blessed us with relationships that we hold dear and who guides us in life to live fully by bringing blessings to others. The scripture for this morning is John, the 17th chapter, 1 to the 11th verse. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son that thy son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, but they have kept thy word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. And all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. Pastor Duane will now give us the message. Thank you, Pastor Barb. Jesus lifted his eyes to heaven and spoke these words with his disciples gathered round. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son. It might sound like it, but this was not a football team prayer before a game time. 
John records these words as being prayed immediately before traveling to the garden where Jesus is arrested and taken for his trial and crucifixion. Jesus is facing the cross, an experience of tribulation, loneliness, and ultimately death. He's facing a pandemic of trauma, trauma that had far-reaching consequences. And here is his prayer, spoken out loud that we might learn from it. It's a prayer some liken to the Lord's Prayer, as is given to us in the Gospel of Matthew, when the disciples asked Jesus to teach them to pray. In the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all three, they tell of a prayer that Jesus uh, says that's a little bit different than this one in John. This prayer is given in the Garden of Gethsemane just before Judas's betrayal and Jesus' arrest. It's a private prayer. I picture Jesus kneeling, hands folded, head down in humility. Father, if possible, may this cup be taken from me. In other words, he prayed, God, I'd really rather not be glorified if it's all the same to you. The public prayer that we read of in John and the private prayer in the Synoptic Gospels, both are prayers of petition. One is a request to be uplifted in glory, while the other shares a quiet cry for relief from what certainly had to be raising fear in the part of Jesus that was fully human. To ask for God to exert power in our lives is one of many ways and many, one of many reasons to pray. When we pray to ask God for something, this is often where people become disheartened, disillusioned, confused, or bewildered. How often are our prayers calling on God to give us increase in some way? Or in more desperate times, our prayer is a cry for salvation because ev events are out of our control. How often do we pray, glorify me, God, but make it easy. Don't make me suffer the necessary sacrifice. In Scripture, Jesus advocates and promises believers, ask and ye shall receive. Yet in James, we also read, yet even when you do pray, your prayers are not answered because you pray for selfish reasons. So how do we pray? How do we reconcile these scriptures? And how do we converse with God and receive what we truly need? Here's a story that illustrates how we want prayer to work. It's a story told by Isaac Asimov about a rabbi who was having difficulties in, with the synagogue leadership. They couldn't agree on anything. So the president of the board called them all together to work it out. Ten members, the president, and the rabbi gathered around a large mahogany table. The evening drug out, and they still couldn't come to an agreement. Finally, the president said, this has gone on long enough, and he called for a vote. The vote was 1-4 and 11 against. The rabbi was alone. So he stood up, lifted his hands and eyes, and prayed to the Holy One of Israel to give a sign that he was right and the others were wrong. I've prayed that prayer a lot of times, but I've never gotten the answer that the rabbi got. Immediately upon the rabbi praying, there was a loud clap like thunder and a brilliant flash of lightning struck the mahogany table, cracked it in two. The room was filled with smoke and fumes and the president and the elders were hurled to the floor. Surrounded by rubble, the rabbi stood erect and untouched, his eyes and smile flashing with triumph. <clears throat> Slowly, the president lifted himself out of the rubble. His hair was singed, his glasses were hanging from one ear, his clothing was in disarray. Finally, the president said, all right, so the vote's 11 to two, but we still have the majority. This story rather reminds me of an Old Testament story of the power of prayer. 
1 King tells a story of the prophet Elijah. King Ahab was taking counsel from priests of a pagan Canaanite god. Elijah, the prophet, challenged the priests of Baal to a test to prove God Almighty greater. The test was that each side would call upon their God to light fire to sacrifices that they had prepared. The priests of Baal were unsuccessful. When Elijah had his sacrifice ready, he prayed, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, and I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your word. Then the fire of the Lord fell upon the sacrifice and consumed it all, which had been drenched in water. And the wood and the stones and the dust, and it licked up the water that was in the trench around the sacrifice. It was a great triumph for Elijah. God responded to Elijah's prayer. But I think even today, there are prophets of Baal out there proclaiming that they have the majority. Reverend Charles Stanley has preached that we may have problems with their prayers being unanswered because we don't pray to the one true God, but we pray to a God that we make up in our own minds, the one who is an image of us and our own desire rather than the other way around. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus appeals to God's power. He prays for God to take this cup from him. I have no doubt that an omniscient God would and could respond to that request. But Jesus continues the prayer, not my will, God, but yours. To ask for God's intervention in the face of tribulation only makes sense. God can and has worked miracles. Not every time and not for every one, but as is his will. What is important is that you ask. And then that you continue that prayer, listening and embracing the answer. Sometimes the answer is immediate. Sometimes it takes years, for time is not the same to God as it is to us. In the Gospel of John, Jesus lifted his eyes to heaven and spoke these words. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son. At first, you might think that Jesus is teaching something of a prosperity gospel or he was seeking recognition for himself, for his power over people. But Jesus' ultimate desire is something other than his own glory. Glorify your son, he prays, that your son may also glorify you. This is the same prayer that Elijah prayed, that God be glorified. Jesus' prayer in the Gospel of John is not one that is born of a desire to exert power, nor is it one that calls on God to exercise control, but it is a reflection of Jesus' true desire from the depths of his soul, at the depth of his being, in total mindfulness, Jesus prays that his action would glorify God, that it would point to the reality of that which exists outside of time and space and outside of all understanding. Jesus' kingdom is that of spirit and of being and living. At the core of Jesus' being, his desire was no more than to be the person God called him to be, even in the face of an injustice and abuse of power. In verse 4, Jesus proclaims, I have glorified you on earth. I have finished the work which you have given to me. He did not spend his time on earth for his own agenda, but for God's. 
at the core of Jesus's prayer, the punchline, so to speak, uh, in verse 11, at the end of our scripture reading for today, Jesus prays, Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. We glorify God, the Father and Son, when we are one in the Spirit. So even in our separation, even as we are socially distanced, may we remain in unity as one body, seeking to find ever more creative ways to be in our living and in our relationships, a reflection of God's image. Amen. I would ask that you would pray with me. Lord, we come to you on this Memorial weekend and as we think back through history, let us remember, let us remember those saints that have gone before. And as Pastor Duane has pointed out, those mentors that have touched our lives and guided us, that we may use them as a model of faith and strength. Lord, we take, we take a, a moment to lift up those names to you in remembrance. As Pastor Duane has pointed out, it's not time to look back, but to look forward. Lord, in our daily life, as we come up against situations, help us to remember how to ask for your help, how to pray. How should we pray? And what should we be praying for? Guide us, Lord. Guide us and open our hearts so that we can truly seek you and we can understand that we are your servants and we are on this earth to serve you, not ourselves, not special interests, but you. Give us the strength and give us the courage to do that. Lord, we ask for your grace upon this congregation as we struggle to be one, though separated. Help us to look forward to that day when we can once again be one, gathered together in your house and in your name to give you the glory, to give you the praise. We ask for your grace upon this town, our state, our country, and, oh, Lord, we ask for your grace upon this world where there is still war and anger and hate and destruction. We ask also your prayer to be with those who are still battling this pandemic as it ravages country after country. Have mercy, Lord. Give knowledge. Give a way that we can comfort those who are stricken and show us a path that we can find a remedy. Lord, guide us through our daily lives as we are walking through this time that is so strange and so new and so awkward and we sometimes worry. Help us to remember that we have nothing to worry about. If we have placed our faith on you, there is no room for worry. Lord, we ask for all these things in the name of your Son, who prayed for us then and now. In his name, amen.